Good day, everybody. My name is Larry Schofield, and it is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce Jay Thompson as our presenter. He began his career at Clemson University, participating in asphalt and concrete research studies while pursuing his graduate degree in civil engineering. He has been involved in the field of construction materials for 19 years. He had the opportunity to spend 10 of those years with the South Carolina DOT, serving in the roles of resident construction engineer and state pavement design engineer. He is currently employed by CEPI Engineering and Construction Incorporated as their construction engineering manager for South Carolina, but he still spends considerable time focusing on pavement related issues and projects. And perhaps the most interesting and important thing is Jay spends most of his free time with his wife, Cherie, and two young children, Jesse and Daisy, doing whatever he can talk them into doing outdoors. And if this, tell, this last statement will tell you a lot about him, he is a human being and puts his pants on one leg at a time. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him and he's going to talk to you about South Carolina DOT's super smooth reconstruction of SC 544. Jay, it's all yours. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that I worked on before I came over to SEBI when I was with SCDOT, where we used some alternative methods to reconstruct the primary route in South Carolina. Before I get too far into this, I want to make sure that I thank um, Luke Gibson and Laura Klein for their help in getting this together, as well as uh, Cliff Selkinghouse for his support during construction, and all of the people in District 5 at SCDOT for allowing us to try out this new method of reconstruction. So SC544, as I said, was a primary route in Horry County of South Carolina. It has about 35,080 T and 15% trucks. So a good bit of traffic there. It's this section was selected, it was only about 2.84 miles, and it's right adjacent to Coastal Carolina University coming out of Conway. The remainder of the road will be done uh, in subsequent years. This was the first section that we've gotten to rehabilitate in, in quite a while. There hadn't been a lot of work done out there in a long time other than just maintenance work. It's a four-lane road with a paved median. And uh, it, it came up as a ranked candidate in our system for rehabilitation uh, due to its condition. It was in, in pretty bad shape, and the district was considering doing full depth reclamation on this road. Uh, we do a lot of full depth reclamation in South Carolina, and that's not something that's new to us. However, doing full depth reclamation on a high volume primary route in a uh, tourist area is not something that we do very often and has its own set of concerns. So we went out to evaluate it for full depth reclamation, but we were looking for other ways to fix this problem, other ways to solve this mousetrap or construct this mousetrap, I guess. And this comes up in South Carolina a good bit. Across the top of the page here, you can see where Highway 501 comes out of Conway. This is the main artery into Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So a lot of people use that road. 544 diverts off of that from Conway and goes down to the South Strand. So there's a lot of local significance to this road. There's been a, a great deal of development in this area over the last 10 to 15 years as well. These two things in general are very representative of a lot of other routes, primary routes in South Carolina where we need to get some work done, and it's not the easiest place to work. So we've been, again, looking for some ways to try to, uh, to tackle this situation, and this is one, of, one way that we decided. The existing conditions out here, this picture shows basically the minimum. Uh, this is kind of the best case scenario. We had low to moderate in intensity longitudinal cracking pretty much everywhere. This is right adjacent to the football stadium at Coastal Carolina University. And, and again, this is kind of the best case scenario. This is more like what the road looked like. A lot of intermittent areas of T 
peat cracking and potholing. Maintenance was constantly having to come out here and put a little bit of mix in the road to fix this, having problems with that. Up and down the road, there were just problem areas. We could also see a frequent occurrence of these low to moderate intensity transverse cracks that were occurring. This was indicative of the cement treated base that's underneath there. And these are reflective cracks coming through. Picture in the top left hand corner here is kind of one of the worst case scenarios, but there was a fair amount of it out there. Fatigue cracking uh, in both lanes in this case, where the asphalt was cracked all the way through. As you can see on the right, this is another one of those transverse cracks, reflective cracks, where it was coming through the base and cracked all the way through the asphalt. In general, the asphalt out here was just worn out. It had given its life. We've gotten good service out of it, but it was done. It was time to be replaced. We saw about three and a half to four and a half inches of asphalt in place out there on average. But there were quite a few different types of base cores. And this is something that was proven to be a little bit difficult if we were going to do full depth reclamation. It was definitely not one consistent pavement type as we went up and down the road. We had some cement treated base. We had some normal graded aggregate base, which was marine limestone local to the area. As you can see on the bottom left, this was a, a picture of a core where we just had normal marine limestone base. It had partially cemented itself together, but not in a very consistent manner. All of this, the asphalt was cracked through on the top. And then other areas of cement treated base, it was common to see a little bit of deterioration in the top of that base as well. For the most part though, the base was performing adequately and the asphalt was just worn out. Full depth reclamation of this was gonna be difficult, especially when you added in something like this picture. Everybody that's done any pavement investigations know that at times it's like a, a box of chocolates. You're, you're gonna find something out there that you didn't expect to see. In this case, there were several areas that we had more than two feet of asphalt. The scenarios of having this much asphalt thickness in place, as well as varying base types, along with the high traffic of this area, makes it difficult to pull down the reclamation. So we elected to just replace the asphalt. We thought if we could get a little more asphalt thickness out there than was in place and be able to address the deficiencies in the cement treated base that were right in the top by milling out five inches, that we'd probably get a good product that would last us for quite some time. So we decided to mill and replace five inches and do this in one thick lift with a mixture called Intermediate B Special. And then we we're gonna diamond grind that to get smoothness. So what is Intermediate B Special? It's a mixture that we've been using in South Carolina for a few years now to do thick lift paving. Scenarios where we have to go in at nighttime and rebuild a pavement and get back to the existing grade um, have been where we use this type of approach. So this mix was designed in order to help maximize that effort. And basically it has, it was an old 12 and a half millimeter surface course that we added some extra binder to by decreasing the target air voids. And we also use a warm mix additive to aid in compaction. That warm mix additive also helps us keep our truck temperatures well during haul times. And this results in a relatively tender mix. So it has to be placed in a combined condition in a hole. We use PG64 for the tack coat, so you don't have to wait until the tack breaks, and it speeds up some of the pavement at night. 
because we're doing it in one thick lift, you don't have to worry about changing mixes throughout the night. And once the plant gets used to producing this one type of mix, uh, you can you can get a pretty consistent product. And also, there's no special equipment required to do this. Conventional paving equipment is utilized. The only thing that that we do use here is a, a MTV in order to help uh, deliver a consistent mix to the paper. So why do we use intermediate B special? Well, number one, our typical means for rehabilitating a roadway like this is to mill and replace two inches of this surface board. If we would have milled two inches everywhere on this road and then ran on it, that would have given us about an inch and a half of asphalt over this variable base course and it probably would have broken up and failed and we probably would have had problems with it. Everybody also knows that we start off with good intentions of milling and we don't want to leave that milled surface open for very long, but sometimes weather happens and it stays open for longer than you want. This was a road that we were afraid if it stayed open, we we're going to have difficulties. So if we can go out and cut out as much as we can replace in a night and then be able to put that back at the same grade, we will have no drop offs which is good because there's a lot of motorcycle riders in this area. So we've improved our safety. And with this thick lift, we're allowed to do this work uh, during the winter. Again, earlier I said, we only allowed nighttime work for this lane closures. So nighttime work and winter is the coldest time of the year, obviously. But because we're putting it back in a thicker lift, we can, we can, allow that placement temperature to be a little bit lower than it would be if it was thinner. So doing this work during the winter time also maximizes the use of the contractors in South Carolina. We got a lot of work that we need to get fixed. Contractors need, they want good work with good production during the summer, uh, during the winter time. And we do as well. Now also South Carolina has used this material on several projects in the recent past. Um, reconstruction of about 10 miles on I-85, reconstruction of four miles on I-385, 10 miles on I-26, and a number of temporary pavements on interstate reconstruction projects, as well as an eight inch thick section that was placed on the NCAT test track that has been performing very well after more than two years of loading. So we, we knew that we had good confidence in the performance of this thick lift material. The diamond grinding was the new part. All of our applications of this thick lift material in the past have been covered with a lift of surface and a lift of open graded friction course on pop. That gave us the ability to fix any ride issues. In this case, we were tied down by curve and gutter. We wanted to come back to the existing grade and not have drop offs. So we had to have a way to fix the ride. And that's what the diamond grinding was going to do. Why do we need the diamond grinding? Well, on thick lift paving, if you stop the paver, you're going to have a bump. If you are not paying attention to your roller pattern, you're going to have another bump. It's not a very forgiving paving process. In conventional paving, we place numerous relatively thin layers. Each one has the opportunity to correct for any mistakes of the previous layer. But with a thick lift, you got to get it all right in one go. Or you got to have a process like this diamond grinding to come back in and fix some of those inconsistencies in the surface. Also, South Carolina does not allow the placement of surface cores between October and March. This is a, yet another way that we can finish up these projects during the winter time and get good use of our contractors year round. On top of that, South Carolina has done several hundred miles of diamond grinding on concrete pavements for preservation in recent years. 
And we, we also diamond grind all of our new concrete pavements on the interstate in order to have a nice smooth start for that pavement's life. So we were very comfortable with diamond grinding as an operation, especially on concrete pavements. This was the first time that we've tried it out on asphalt. That being said, the test section that I mentioned at NCAT did use diamond grinding on the asphalt surface, and we found that it held up well to traffic there. So we did have a, a small exposure to it there, but that was a small part. This was the first time that we used it on a larger project. So we needed a new special provision for diamond grinding, and this special provision focused on keeping it simple and utilizing our existing specifications. We worked along with IGGA to develop some minimum equipment requirements and the textural requirements that we wanted to see from the final product. Those focused on the groove configuration, and we didn't want to have a lot of holidays on this project. We anticipated that the holidays on asphalt pavement may stand out a good bit, so we wanted to try to get a, as much of the pavement textured as possible, and we finally settled on requirement of 95% of any 100 foot section of pavement must be textured. The final ride requirement was an adaptation of our existing specification. The biggest thing that we changed was is we set a minimum. For, the biggest thing that we changed was is we set an IRI requirement of 70 for repair. If, if the ROI in the end was higher than 70 inches per mile, we were going to require re repair or additional grinding be done. 100% pay was given from 44 to 65 inches. And then we had two levels of bonus. 107% bonus could be paid for anything less than 39. And that bonus is paid up per ton of asphalt. That gives us a pretty good incentive to get a smooth road. The results turned out very well. As you can see the picture on the right here, we ended up with a pretty consistent surface. I do show a small holiday here on the right, but for the most part, the surface was textured and our requirements were definitely met. And everybody was happy with it. The paving started in the second week of January and was completed in the first week of March. About 30,000 tons of intermediate speed special was placed. We had good results on the asphalt mixture characteristics as well as compaction, and the paving turned out well. The grinding started in the second week of April and was completed in the first week of May. 106,000 square yards of diamond grind. There were very few complaints from the public. We didn't have to maintain that milled surface and everything turned out very well. I say here that we had a reduced noise relative to the adjacent section. We didn't measure that noise, but to me, it sounds quieter than the asphalt on either end of the project. And the smoothness turned out good as well. The pre-grind IRI was as high as 132 inches per mile, so we definitely did have some bumps in this thick lift paving, but the post-grind IRI got down as low as 21 inches per mile. We had an average of 35, which is pretty smooth. We saw a reduction in pre-grind to post-grind of about 56%. This is what some of the results look like going down the road. As you can see, this was the, the outside lane in the eastbound direction. So this is the one tying into the curve and gutter. Uh, pre-grind is red, post-grind is blue. So you can see here the about 50% or more reduction shown here. And most of those values are, are down here between 35 and, and 45. The inside lane looks even better with most of the values in the 20s and 30s. We definitely see some future uses for this process moving forward. As I said before, South Carolina is looking for ways to reconstruct our primary routes. Back in 2017, the, just the NHS portion of our primary routes, you can see on the, the pie chart here, 
uh, would have a lot of candidates that would likely need reconstruction. We're trying to get that percent good from 32 up to closer to 70 percent by around 2027. We're going to have to do a lot of reconstruction in order to accomplish that. And places where this process makes sense, our high traffic areas, especially where we have a lot of tourism activity, and it really benefits us to try to get this work done during the wintertime, is an ideal place for us to try to use this process. So I look for SEDOT to, to be trying this out some more as we move forward. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them now. Thank you very much, Jay, and great job. I got a couple questions here for you. And the first one is how soon after AC paving do you allow the grinding? So that was good. that's a good question. Larry, um, our specification did not have a time frame on this, but I would have to make the assumption that we would want to make sure that asphalt has cooled sufficiently. So NCAT looked at this, the temperature cooling of uh, this thick lift paving. And while it does retain temperature in the bottom of the lift longer, the surface still cools like a conventional asphalt. So I would assume that it would be okay to be ground within about 24 hours or so. However, um, we at SCDOT made the assumption that the contractor was gonna wanna come in and get the whole job paid before we came in and diamond ground. So we figured at worst, there was only gonna be a day's worth of paving before the diamond grinding contractor came in. So we didn't feel like we were too worried about that, but not having diamond ground asphalt, I, I might would like to hear your comments on it if you have any to add. Um, well, I mean, it's not all that different than when you're doing bump grinding. And I think typically you have the uh, um, contractor schedule controlling. I, you know, I, I would definitely think next day personally, but it probably could be done sooner. The Concern I had on some of it was the weight of the equipment versus the depth of your uh, mat placement. So I wouldn't think same day would necessarily be um, the the most desirable. But I, I said that's all the things we got to learn on this. I think absolutely. Now I can say that you know we in the past had some concern about early age rutting and returning traffic to this material, but we've had scenarios where we placed ten inches and return traffic to it on the interstate of I-85 within an hour or two at most. And we didn't have any issue with rutting. So I, I'm thinking that we're probably okay with the, the equipment. Okay, that being no. said, no need in taking too big of a chance, right? Yeah, no, that, that's good comments. Next question I have for you is, how do you estimate the height change from initial placement to final compaction. And this kind of relates back to the holidays and, and all those kind of things that can happen. Sure, absolutely. So the height change from initial placement to final compaction, let me make sure I'm understanding you. You're saying, how do we try to anticipate how much we're gonna have to grind off of it? Or are we talking about roll down during compaction or a little bit of both? No, this would be roll down during compaction with the idea is if it, there was any differential roll down in it, it would result in some holidays. So that, that's what I was trying to get at. Just like you showed the pictures of the roller marks and stuff like that. Absolutely. So the roll down that occurs just due to compaction with our, our standard rollers is, is really no different than conventional asphalt, which is about a quarter inch per inch. So we've seen that on three inch layers, five inch layers, up to as much as eight inch layers that was placed at NCAT, uh, we saw that quarter inch per inch. So that eight inch layer, we had about a two inch roll down. Um, now, again, like we talked about, if you stop the paver, it's probably gonna end up in a bump, which is to use the words that you used before, differential roll down. Um, it's hard to exactly estimate how much of an issue that's going to be. However, you can see that uh, the initial rideability on this job was 
you know, up around 100 or more. And we were able to get that down relatively easily. I don't think there was any major issues that required multiple, multiple passes with diamond grinder to get down to the, the numbers that we saw, as well as we didn't have any issues with having to grind into the gutter pan or anything like that. Okay, very good. The next question is, is the post grind smoothness a function of the pre grind roughness? And if not, is there a maximum removal thickness? So I think that's a great question. Um, while it certainly does appear that the post grind smoothness could be a function of the pre grind smoothness, our specification was not based on a percent improvement. We simply had a, a final number that had to be met. Now, as we do more of this, maybe a percent improvement would be a better way to go. And, and I think it gets to the, the question that, that you're asking about, how do we make sure we don't take too much off? Could that be an issue? Yes, it absolutely could. On this one, this particular project, we anticipated that we would control it with the curve. Uh, we were not going to allow this grinding to go down into the, the curb line. So we knew that we could we could kind of see what was happening on that outside edge. Uh, but I do think that this needs to be considered in, in future projects to make sure that we don't remove too much. Very good. And the next question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge for grinding contractors with this new process? So I think that the biggest challenge could be related to your last question. Uh, is the final ride based on a percent improvement or a hard number? And how smooth is that initial paving going to be? Uh, these answers will end up dictating the amount of effort necessary to get down to that acceptable roughness. So, it, again, if it's a hard number specification to get to, is contractor A going to be as smooth as contractor B? And how much effort does it take me to get down to that final number? Um, and I think uh, maybe we, we need to be considering that in how we write our specifications moving forward. Okay. And the last question is, how cost effective is this strategy compared to what is normally done? So this is an important question, but it's one that's also a little difficult to answer. Um, to put it simply, this process, we have to put down the same amount of asphalt either way. So there's no cost savings on the asphalt itself. The cost of diamond grinding is actually additional. So, however, it, it does come with its benefits, as I described earlier in the presentation. And we also got a good price on the grinding, given the size of the project. So long story short, you may get a somewhat improved price on the asphalt if the project is timed in an effective manner during the winter. But the overall cost of this type of work is going to be slightly more than conventional work, uh, minus some of the headaches that come along with that conventional work, though. To me, it's, it's still cost effective, but it's not intended to be utilized everywhere. This is a tool that, that is meant to fit these particular characteristics of this road. So where it makes sense to me, I think it's still cost effective because we're not greatly increasing the cost. We're only increasing the cost just by that price of that diamond ground. And very good. And thank you very much. We really enjoyed your presentation. You did a great job. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it as well.